All right. Um, Welcome back, everybody. I think we're going to start uh, the second part of our afternoon. Um, I am sure that you guys have been all touched by the photo exhibition and um, the archive, our our oral history archive. And we're going to dive into our presentation uh, right now. So we will have presentations on genocide literature and performances. Uh, we'll have three presentations back to back. And these presentations are going to be um, moderated by Dr. Lisa Simeon. Um, I will move the stage for you. Okay, great. Um, welcome back. And um, we are now starting our, um, our panel on gender performance uh, and literature, uh, expressions of genocide. Uh, and uh, we have with us, uh, I don't have my, my brochure, do you? Uh, okay, I'm up here without my brochure. Ah, I have it here. Here it is. I'm Thank sure. you so very much. Okay. Uh, we've got we've got three presentations today. Uh, one by Chanaza Egere uh, and um, one by Abigail Amele Kweye and Viashima David Ko. And there is a typo in the program, I'm afraid. We spelled uh, Viashima's name wrong. Uh, please forgive us, uh, Viashima. These things always seem to slip through. And then Tim Libretti, our very own, who is uh, in person, uh, will follow up uh, with Celeste. And then we'll have some time for discussion. Uh, so without further ado, Chinaza, you have the floor. Thank you very much. So today um, I'll be presenting a, a paper titled Reconstructing Gender Identities, Resistance and Transformation in Chinua Shibe Stains Fall Apart and Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's The Headstrong Historian. So gender identities in African literature have been frequently studied and reevaluated, shedding light on the complexity of authority, tradition, and resistance. Gina Chibesin's famous work, Things Fall Apart, and Chimamanda Adichie's telling short story, the headstrong historian, both examine the complicated world of gender roles and identities. These two Nigerian literary classics give readers a glimpse into the struggles and shifts in gender identities, as well as how these identities are reconstructed, drawing an African literary feminism and post-colonial theory, this study analyzes how the two texts, both seminal works in African literature, portray the fluidity and transformation of gender identities in Nigeria in response to colonial impacts and sociocultural shifts. Achebe's novel provides insight into pre-colonial Igbo society on scoring patriarchal traditions and masculinity. In contrast, Adichie's protagonist redefines and transforms womanhood true courageous acts of resistance and knowledge production and destabilizing patriarchal historiography and reclaiming space for female voices. So this part argues that while navigating external pressures, the test characters reconstructs gender identities by preserving aspects of their African cultural roots. The study reveals the multifaceted dynamics of gender roles in Nigeria and their literary representation. In addition to making contributions to the feminist study of African literature and history, the study elucidates the complex intersectionality between cultural colonialism, agency, and gender dynamics. It contributes to the ongoing scholarship on gender identities in African literature and highlights the interaction between literature, culture, and societal constructs while advocating for a more inclusive and gender conscious narrative paradigm that opposes dominant patriarchal practices and highlights the accomplishments of women throughout history. Okay, so 
The post-colonial epoch has borne witness to a proliferation of African literary expressions grappling with the enduring legacies of colonialism, the intricacies of identity, and the intersection of diverse social forces. Gender, as an integral facet of identity, assumes a central role in despairing the subtleties of African societies in the aftermath of historical ruptures and, and amidst contemporary challenges. African literature, deeply rooted in oral traditions and mythologies, has undergone a transformative evolution, encompassing a broad spectrum of voices, perspectives, and narratives. It serves as a distinctive platform for authors to navigate the complexities inherent in gender roles, agency, and representation within the ever-shifting social cultural landscapes. At your best things fall apart, and at the the headstrong historian stand out as significant con contributors to the ongoing conversation. Each of these works offers a distinctive viewpoint delving into the nuanced aspects of resistance and transformation within gender roles within their respective cultural contexts. So Adichie is the headstrong historian, particularly elucidates the portrayal of women in pre-colonial societies, engaging with and reiterating the importance of an African perspective in both literature and history. So this ex engagement extends to the discourse on authentic representation, where Adichie's work challenges existing perspectives, presenting them as valid and well-documented within historical context. Fundamentally, acknowledging diverse power dynamics aligns with Achebe's goal to affirm African history, history sophistication, dispelling Eurocentric narratives. Achebe consistently expressed his intention with things fall apart, aiming to convey to African readers that their past with all its imperfections was not one night of savagery from which the first Europeans acting on God's behalf delivered them. And understanding the intricate nuances of power and gender dynamics from the perspective of African feminist theory establishes a solid foundation for examining the female agency team, uh, female agency team, emphasizing women's strengths and resilience in African society. So we have esteemed scholars like Oyoron K, Oyeo, me, Ifi Amajume, and Amina Mamash. They shape the analytical framework of a, theo a theoretical perspective to unravel the complexities of gender identities within traditional African societies. So in alignment with this viewpoint, Ant contends that gender debates influenced by post-structuralism have given rise to an understanding of the dynamics, complexity, and div diversity of feminism, which makes it difficult to speak of feminism rather than feminism. So this plurality emerges from a wide range of coordinates with regional differences playing an important role. Partly, in protest, the white history and the white domination within feminism, but also due to the necessity of taking into account the material circumstances and cultural histories of African societies, African feminism has formed. So in essence, it becomes extremely important to embrace diverse feminist perspectives that capture the various experiences and viewpoints in the global feminist discourse highlighting the imperativeness of the nuanced grasp of the sociocultural milieu. And to further elucid elucidate this, and says that African feminism aims at upsetting the existing uh, metrics of domination and overcoming it. Thus, transforming gender relationships and conceptions in African societies and improving the situation of African women. And implies a profound reconstruction of gender uh, relationships and conceptions prevalent in African societies. To encapsulate this, African feminism seeks to empower women by you know, challenging oppressive structures and redefining discriminatory societal norms for gender equity. So this study grounded in African feminist theory analyzes reconstructed gender identities, resistance and transformation in selected novels, considering cultural nuances, provides inclusive feminist perspective on gender dynamics in a specific regional context, often insight into African literary portrayals of transformative gender journeys. So now we will be looking at things fall apart. So transitioning to the exploration of this theme in things fall apart, Achebe delves into the traditional Igbo society, unraveling the intricate dynamics of masculinity and femininity. The protagonist, Okunko, epitomizes the rigid expectations placed upon men, emphasizing physical strength 
and dominance, his perpetual fear of resembling his father, Onuka, who was deemed a coward and a failure, is evident in the narrative. Onuka, for that was his father's name, had died 10 years ago. In his day, he was lazy and improvident. Onuka's reputation as a loafer and his impoverished settles, coupled with his aversion to war, intensified Okonkos disdain for him. Onuka's cowardice, as he would not bear the sights of blood, dipping the divide between father and son. Okonko, in stark contrast, emerges as a man unafraid of war, described as a man of action. His actions and beliefs perpetuate the strict gender rules and hierarchies within the Igbo community. His toxic masculinity is very much palpable in his relationship with his wives. He exemplifies a certain sense of strength and bravery and dominance, propelled by an intrinsic motivation to affirm his masculinity in reaction to the perceived frailty of his father. So his steadfast adherence to traditional gender roles and unrelenting pursuit of a rigid masculinity served to perpetuate the patriarchal norms entrenched within his community. Biodun posits Okunko's representation of femaleness as weakness and irresolutness seems to have validation in the system of division of cognitive and perceptual. Please, Arden, I'm still with you. Okay, have validation in the system of division of cognitive and perceptual categories in her society, which ascribes the designation female to smaller crops like the cocayam and the designation male to bigger crops like the yam. A system which also describes an or true abomination as either female or male, depending on the degree of threat or destabilization to the social order that it poses. So this stringent stance extends to his you know, familiar domain, particularly in his interactions with his son, Moye, who, despite being a male 12 years old, becomes a focal point of Okunko's apprehension due to alleged indolence. So seeking correction, Okunko resorts to a regimen of persistent admonishment and physical chastisement at any rate. That was what it looked to his father and he sought correction by constant nagging and beating. Moreover, the narrative delineates Okunko's unyielding pressure on Woye marked by ominous threats and a steadfast insistence on the expectation of male dominance and authority within the clan. He will not have a son who cannot hold up his head in the gathering of the clan and that he will strangle him with his hands. Okunko's singular aspiration revolves around Woye, maturing into a young man capable of assuming the mantle of leadership within the household after his inevitable passing. However, as the narrative unfolds, Okunko's, Okunko confronts resistance and adversities, instigating a discernible reconstruction of gender identities. Now, we we'll say this metamorphosis, okay, it becomes conspicuous in Okunko's rapport with his daughter, Ezima and his eventual acknowledgement of her, intellectual, of her intellectual acumen and resilience. This acknowledgement defies conventional gender expectations, marking a pivotal moment indicative of the potential for you know, reformulating op oppressive gender roles. Okonko's continual expressions of admiration for Izima and his explicit wish for her to be a male offspring underscore her exceptional attributes. Oh, if Izima had been a boy, I would have been happier. She has the right spirit. Okonko's expression of his feelings, emphasizing Izima's deep understanding and instinctive connection with his thoughts, portrays the fact that exceptional qualities can be found in any gender as opposed to his dogmatic and patriarchal beliefs. Furthermore, a meticulous exploration into the emotional dimensions of Okonko's masculinity unveils instances of vulnerability and internal conflict, presenting a more intricate portrayal of the nuanced interplay between societal expectation and Okonko's emotional struggle, thereby contributing to a profound comprehension of the ev evolution of masculinity within the cultural context depicted in the narrative. So the manifestation of his embodied mind and his masculinity trans transcends conventional societal expectations, delving into the realm of emotional intelligence or lack thereof. So this deficiency becomes greatly apparent in his execution of Ikemefuna, a young boy who regarded him as a father, despite stern warnings. Okonko's fear of being perceived as weak compels him to you know, partake in the execution. 
afraid of being thought weak. A poignant act rooted in Okunko's relentless devaluation of his wives, reducing them to mere objects for sexual gratification and symbolic displays of his achievements. So the, the consequences of Okunko's toxic masculinity and misogynistic tendencies persist, overshadowing any semblance of remorse for Ike Mufuna's death. His conscience grapples with the gravity of the act, yet Okunko remains resolute, questioning his vulnerability and rationalizing the deed. So his deep-seated aversion towards femaleness exacerbates the impact of his actions, leading to the physical abuse of his wives, and in a moment of unbridled uh, violence, the shooting of his second wife, Ekwifi, at the slightest provocation. Okunko's regret over fathering a son like Woye, whom he deems degenerate and effeminate, illuminates the intensity of his disdain for traits associated with femininity. He attends, his attempt to oppose colonialism is considered ineffective due to an overpowering manifestation of masculinity. JUFO contains that Okunko struggles with colonial conquest and nascent imperialist domination, but with an aggressively masculinist personality and his deep alienations. And likely on account of, his, of this contradiction, his resistance is futile. His commitment to a hyper-masculine identity undermines his ability to effectively resist the encro encroachment of colonial forces. Davis reinforces this perspective, st stating that in the troubled world of things fall apart. In the troubled, uh, in the troubled world of things fall apart, motherhood and femininity are the unifying mitigating principles, the lessons for Congo, the lessons for Africa and the world. So why aggressive masculinity may hinder resistance? embracing qualities traditionally associated with femininity could potentially provide a more constructive response to the challenges presented by colonialism. Okay, so we'll be looking at Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's short story, which is the headstrong historian. So the analysis emphasizes the significance of examining the feminist gender perspective through the headstrong historian. So the main character of the headstrong historian is inspired by anecdotes about Adichie's resolute great grandmother, a connection Adichie, you know, humorously acknowledged as guest describes or writes, described as a contemporary feminist reinterpretation as at the best things fall apart, Adichie's response to the categorization of her work as a feminist adaptation of Adichie's. Uh, Achebez was marked by subtle green. She commented that she, such an interpretation is not unfavorable, suggesting an acceptance and acknowledgement of the feminist lens through which her short story is, per, is perceived. So Anene elucidates that. Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's short story, The Headstrong Historian, offers a woman's perspective on the Igbo encounter with European colonialism, a history made famous by Chino Achebez's things fall apart who told the story from a male perspective. So through her short story, Adichie enacts the dual sex system that scholars argue is at the basis of evil societies. So Adichie does this by telling the story from the perspective of her female protagonists. So in the process, Adichie makes two points. Firstly, there is not a single story about the evil past. Secondly, European colonialism had significant negative repercussions for evil women. So the women in Adichie's short story, at least the non-Christian ones, are strong and independent individuals who take charge of their own lives. So Adichie's characterization of women in you know, her strong historian suggests that the intervention of Christianity and European rule had deleterious effects on Igbo women's agency. So the narrative not only challenges historical perspectives and stereotypes, but also explores the diverse experiences of Igbo women during a crucial period in their history. Doherty poses that in one respect, Adichie's story is a kind of a 50th anniversary tribute to what might be considered an original novel of African literature. As such, it's a kind of gentle corrective to Achebe responding to some of you know, his more stringent critics, particularly on issues of gender roles in the novel. Fame Funa or Grace and her grandmother Mwamba stand as characters that would undoubtedly receive the approval of Igbo writer Flora Wampa 
who may assess that assess that Wangba, Reverend, uh, revered as the mother of African literature, expressed dissatisfaction with how African male authors depicted African women. So in things fall apart, women are relegated to the sidelines, and their lack of extensive dialogue, you know, makes it easy to perceive them as subordinate or even oppressed. Many readers interpret this portrayal of women in things fall apart as a mere reflection of historical reality. It does not fully depict the agency and ways in which women in the pre-colonial era reconstructed gender identities by exhibiting qualities, wisdom, and prowess that made them stand out. However, in the headstrong historian where women take on central roles, it is the adoption of Christianity and the introduction of new ideas about marriage, you know, by Christian missionaries that diminish the authority and choices available to women. Mwamba, the protagonist, is portrayed as possessing a man's physical strength and abilities. A father found her exhausting. She is this sharp tongued, headstrong daughter who had once wrestled her brother to the ground, an act that he considers inappropriate and less dignifying for the brother. It is she who would become perplexed by Agnes on Weke, her you know, daughter-in-law, who in her eyes appears weak and harboring of familiar notions about inappropriate you know, feminine conduct and feels or certain of how to handle a woman crying about things that, that did not deserve tears. She takes premeditated actions in fighting back her husband's lazy cousins for their conventionalness and greediness, by complaining to the Women's Council, and 21 went at night to Okafa and Okoye's home with brandishing pistols, wanting them to leave one by alone. Her strong, opinionated personality is seen so palpable that Father Shenahan asserts there was something troublingly assertive about her. There was much potential to be harnessed if the wilderness in her could be tamed. This Wamba would make a missionary among women. She Wamba would, however, stick to her traditional beliefs and practices, thereby resisting and opposing colonialism, and would express her fervent desire to see her granddaughter, Grace, before she passes away. She believes that Grace is a reincarnation of her demised husband, Obierika, a man who is perceived as the stark contrast of Okunko with regards to excessive masculinity, and who treasured her despite her lengthy struggle with infertility and miscarriages. Mwamba's resistance as is also highly unapologetic as she adamantly rejects the idea of anyone applying filthy oil on her in the name of converting to Christianity. And Ikwenwa, her son, informs her that Grace, who is supposed to, you know, to be taking school exams, cannot come home. But despite this, Grace arrives on her own, driven by a restless spirit, a strong connection to her grandmother with whom she shares similar beliefs. Grace brings along with her Grace brings, you know, along with her, a school bag containing a textbook with a chapter titled The Pacification of the Primitive Tribes of the Lower Tribe, a clear reference to Achebe's you know, parodic ending to his novel, where the story of Okunko is rightly taken up by the district commissioner. Later, she teaches at a school in a village called Agweke, which is synonymous with the one found, you know, in the village of Abeme in Things Fall Apart, where the killing of an unknown white man on the, you know, in the separable conveyance of the bicycle is met with a gruesome massacre of the villagers. It is the story of this village that inspires the historian Grace to write her book, a reclamation of African history from the insider perspective called Sifying with Bullets, a reclaimed history of Southern Nigeria, where she reconstructs her identity and challenges Eurocentric perspectives by telling the African story with the African voice and by resisting, challenging, and redefining gender. So this kind you know, of work is the obvious corrective to what Adishie in a famous TED talk, the danger of a single story, reiterates. Grace will further question her singing of, you know, God bless our gracious king. She considers the allegiance unnecessary and opposes everything that reminds her of colonialism. She considers the allegiance unnecessary, okay? And this is evident in her divorce from George Shikadibia, a stylish graduate of King's College, Lagos, which ended in 1972. So the slit resulted from her inability to further tolerate his constant soliloquies about the, you know, his Cambridge days in her later years. Surrounded by accolades and awards, Grace adopts the cherished name, Afamefuna, symbolizing her cultural heritage 
and embracing the patrimony bestowed upon her by her grandmother. So in conclusion, both things fall apart and the headstrong historian depict the complexities of gender identities in Nigerian society, albeit from different perspectives. So while Achebe's novel portrays the struggles of male protagonists uh, within a patriarchal framework, Adiche's short story highlights the agency and resilience of female characters in resisting colonial oppression through her narratives, both authors, through their uh, uh, to, through their narratives, both authors shed light on the fluidity and transformation of gender identities amidst historical upheaval. The reconstruction of gender identities in African literature reflects the multifaceted you know, nature of cultural dynamics and historical legacies. Through these seminal works, authors explore themes of resistance and transformation, challenging dominant narratives and reshaping societal perceptions of gender. So by centering you know, marginalized voices and offering diverse perspectives, African literature continues to serve as a powerful tool for cultural critique and social change. Thank you. Many, many thanks. Uh, let's um, move on to the next presentation um, online, Abigail. Emily Koye and Vyashima David Ko. Are you there? Yes, we are here. Wonderful. Welcome. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Not sure if I'm doing the right thing. Is, is my screen being shared at the moment? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. We can see your screen, yeah. Yes, um, thank you. Um, my name is Abigail Amelekwe. I am a, a PhD student in performance studies at the University of Alberta. And today I'm be, I'm presenting with um, David Baishma, who is in, in um, Wisconsin, Madison. And our paper is on um, negotiations in inter- uh, heterosexual economies, queer politics, and performativity. And this paper has really been inspired by uh, a, a video we saw of um, a cross-dresser who post content on uh, social media. Now, the interesting part of it is in the public space, nobody has a problem with um, cross-dressing or wearing um, female presenting clothes but uh, a video of him surfaced on social media again in his private space still wearing female presenting um clothes and that um sparked a lot of outrage so um we became interested in really delving into how um people are navigating oppression, how systems and structures are also constructing a narrative on performativity. So I will hand over to um, David to take over. And this is the outline of our presentation, queer fear centering heteronormativity, playing with gender subversions. Um, we also consider colonial mimicry as advanced by Homi Baba and then um, thinking through gender caricature, queer politics, and really delving into my special area of performance. And that will continue. So David, you are, you're good to go. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so uh, I think how we forge uh, three of the contents. Excuse me, can I interrupt media? for just a moment? Could you perhaps play the slideshow as you go so that we can see the slides better? Oh my, this is okay. Oh, awesome, thank you. Yeah. Oh, great, thank you. Wonderful, okay, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. So can, can you hear me? 
Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. So um, are we are we for the three uh, items I'm supposed to speak on um, just so we, we keep to time? So um, now our presentation um, looks at two things. First, why does the Nigerian and Ghanaian fear? We are actually focusing on Ghana. Uh, uh, and Nigeria. So why is it that the indigenous Nigerian and Ghanaian queer-identified person need the politics of resistance? And how do they resist? Throughout our presentation, we will attempt to show how um, laws legislating uh, sexual relations in Nigeria and Ghana are not merely responses to certain subjects, but they are actually also actively producers of these subjects and their subjectivity. So we'll be looking at first, um, why do these people need any kind of resistance at all? And then how are they resisting? And we will be showing uh, through our discussion that, that these laws that uh, are aimed at regulating how people engage in sexual relations are not only just responses to acts performed by certain people, but then they actually engage in the production of, of uh, certain subjects and the way these subjects express. Uh, they are articulate their subjectivity. Uh, so the need for a politics of resistance is based on legalization, or in the case of Ghana, uh, the intention to legalize uh, homophobia. Uh, three laws criminalize uh, same-sex marriages in Nigeria. Two of these laws are colonial era uh, laws. These are the criminal and the penal codes. Now, the criminal law was established by the uh, British government to enforce British interests and uh, those aspects of indigenous laws and customs that uh, the British first or, or, or uh, uh, the colonial masters first were not part of the barbarous culture. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, they felt that certain ways of relating, certain ways we uh, 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 the, uh, Nigerian cultures uh, articulated their experiences were uh, barbarous. So uh, the criminal law was established specifically to address experiences uh, like that. Homosexual relations existent among the pre-colonial Nigerian people were articulated as aspects of barbarous culture and rejected. This is the historical beginning of the problematization of same-sex relations in Nigeria. Now, the Penal Code enacted during um, Nigeria's independence is based on the teachings of the Quran and the Sudanese uh, Penal Act. Now, the Pena Court did not call homosexual relations aspects of barbarous culture. Rather, it presented uh, homosexual relations as against the order of nature. Now, these two laws problematized homosexual relations that did not ban legal recognition for same-sex relationships. So they were like, good, this is bad, but then, they didn't provide or they, they didn't explicitly say that you can't engage in same-sex marriages or that those who engage in same-sex marriages cannot have legal uh, uh, support for their uh, union. So the SSNPA, which is Nigeria's Same-Sex Marriage Prohibition Act, breached constitutional lacunas unattended by the existing criminal uh, and penal codes that allowed possibilities for same-sex marriages in Nigeria. These lacunas include the failure of the penal and criminal courts to abolish same-sex marriages, 
and the limitations imposed by legal jurisdictions. By legal jurisdictions, I mean the penal code serves those in the south and the, uh, sorry, the, the, the criminal code applies to people in the south and the penal code applies to uh, people in the north. Now in Ghana, the, pro the promotion of proper human sexual rights and Ghanaian family values bill aims to defend proper human sexual rights and Ghanaian family values, prescribes, sorry, proscribes um, LGBTQ plus and related activities, proscribes propaganda of advocacy for or promotion of LGBTQ IAAP plus and related activities and provides for the protection of children. Now, these legal efforts are both reactions to certain events. The SSNPA in Nigeria is a reaction to the advocacy for the rights of protection of members of the LGBTQ community, of the LGBTQ plus community in Nigeria during the International Conference on AIDS in 2005. Ghana's bill is a reaction to the opening of the LGBTQIAAP plus advocacy center resource center in Ghana. Uh, that's that, that, that uh, in Accra, Ghana. The event has the European Union, the Danish ambassador to Ghana, and the Australian High Commissioner to Ghana in attendance. Now, legalized homophobia in Nigeria and Ghana espouses boundaries of legible and illegible subjects based solely on heteronormative speculations to enact their subjectivity. We have identified people in Nigeria and Ghana have adopted several frameworks of resistance, ranging from queering marriages through the heteronormative givens, that is, subverting the traditional understanding of marriage as a civil union between a man and woman by engaging in marriages under heterosexual stipulations, but then engaging in anti-normative arrangements elsewhere. So for example, uh, uh, what I'm trying to talk about is a system where um, I will marry as if I'm a cis person, perhaps contractually, marry as if I'm a cis person, bring a, a, a cis woman into the house, but then, because of our understanding, engage my partner outside. So you are in, you, 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 you've been brought in as my married uh, partner, but then, Marriage itself does not exist within the system because we are, we are just living together. Not that we know that we are just living together. Not that we have any uh, anything to do beyond the fact that we are just uh, pretending to to uh, be uh, living together. So uh, that is why I say that uh, they subvert the traditional understanding of marriage as a civil union between a man and a woman by engaging in marriages under heterosexual stipulations. That is, they engage in anti-normative arrangements elsewhere while being in that marriage. They also engage in embodied performances, querying popular culture, and developing queer means of uh, communication. So in what follows, we look at playing with gender subversions. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, uh... The in the post colonial, there's the 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 big critique of um really centering um the written over embodied knowledge systems and um the revelation is the embodied knowledge systems has a has a way of articulating um the, both the the spiritual the cultural the economic and all other facets of living and being and uh particularly for cultures emerging from or rooted in orality. And so there is this construction that is going on that really um, blends the line between what is playing, merely playing, playing that is meant to evoke laughter and really thinking about the critical discourses of gender subversion. And so um, I trace it back to uh, um, post-colonial uh, colonial mimicry where um, 
the Homi Baba talks about the subject of camouflage and uh, really um, presenting something that is far distinct from what is being actually presented. And then that notion of imagined community also being present where um, there is the privileging of an original culture and then the need for the culture that is now under subjugation really gravitating towards mimicking that which is new to them, that which is fresh to them, that is that which they have now been exposed to. So um, Homi Baba says colonial mimicry is the desire to for a reformed recognizable order as a subject of a difference that is almost the same, but not quite, which is to say the discourse of mimicry is constructed around an ambivalence in order to be effective, mimicry must continually produce its slippage, its excess, its deference. On the authority of that mode of colonial discourse that, uh, that I have um, called mimicry, which is referring to Homi Baba, is therefore stricken by an interminacy and um, talking really about mimicry as a sign of double articulation, a complex strategy of reform, regulation of discipline, which appropriates the order as it visualizes power. And then for, for the final part, it talks about mimicry being a sign of appropriation. However, a different kind of um, articulation in there. And then we really are placed in a, position to look at the power structures or the systems of um, powers that be and the need to constantly um, mimic something that is very distant. Now we are looking at negotiations and peer politics with um, the conversation about um, entrenchment in heteronormativity. How are people navigating or how are people in these rooted in these communities navigating? Of course, um, even if we talk about um, patriarchy, there are two forms of patriarchy where there's the one that is originally rooted in the colonial system and then the one that is um, um, that is imposed through colonialism, the one that is origin originally rooted in the communities proud to colonialism. The same way if um, there's the argument that um, queer or queerness is an importation from um, colonialism, but then there has been evidence of its existence in all indigenous communities. And so this is where we really talk about performance, borrowing from um, battlers and gender trouble to take a critical look at how performance, uh, bodily performance, embodied knowledge, systems are being performed to navigate through structures that exist. And so here, Dinah Taylor says, performance also functions as epistemology where embodied practices along with uh, and bound up with other cultural practices offers a way of knowing. And so when we study the landscape now and the performances, the gender subversions, the double and um, the cross-dressing that is going on, it brings us to question how people are um, really articulating ways of knowing, ways of being, and how these ways of knowing also helps us to understand what the cultural structures that exist are um, maneuvering, um, are helping people to really um, uh, articulate their own voices wherever they find themselves. And, and so um, the picture here is one um, social media content and they um, cross-dress in their um, videos that they post. And so the real question is, when we see these kinds of performances, we laugh, it evokes laughter in us. So, but when we see these performances in their private spaces, then it evokes anger, it evokes um, the, the, the recounting of, penal actions of legal systems that 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 exist. 
So in the, on the social media front or in the performance or in the playing field, all these sub, uh, um, gender subversions are acceptable. But once the camera uh, is now leaving the private and the, the, the public space into the private spaces of these performers, then it is a critical conversation of, are these people really just playing or they have um, uh, an intention to articulate with their performances? And so we come to the subtle art of resistance in heterosexual um, economies. And there's really that expression of um, sexual fluidity in the social media landscape we see through skits and performances and all these skits and performances it's uh, we are really tempted to question if uh, um, it is a way of also in a very subtle way resist um systems that are currently being put in place and then the gender subversions in the private space as i have mentioned really sparks outrage and homophobic attacks Whereas those that are performed as skits or as um uh, or as um on, as we have found on TikTok and all that, when we find those things, we just laugh and we forget about the possibilities of um, nuances that exist in there. And so, um, performance of this and that, really talking about um the popular culture, the popular um performances that that exist. Um, popular art in Africa, and particularly in Ghana and Nigeria. It is a combination of what is being seen, what is being experienced, what is being watched on TV, be it um, from um, the communities that they are positioned in or from the communities that they have engaged with or they have imagined themselves as being a part of. And so there's always that way of combining um, things that have been seen to create content. And in all these contents, we also question, is there more to just playing or just mixing ideas or, and, 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 and creative pieces or creative knowledge? Or there is another layer to really understand how people are wanting to express their sexuality. And so um, really the social political narratives are now similarly buried in wits where the seriousness of the subject is, 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 is wrapped or riddled with laughter. And so we watched or we consume all these videos, we consume all these social media posts and all we do is to laugh. But the real question is, there is a way that these content have been encoded. And then the decoding of it is what has become rather problematic. Is it just playing or it is really a way of articulating a sexual expectation or a sexual expression? And it is a, 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 a performance studies related big question that uh, um, it is still a process of um, uncovering. And then so we also really talk about the serious as laughter. So once we see these serious matters evoking laughter, it, as, it, it serves as a way of really shutting down any criticality that comes with it. And so these people are really finding ways of navigating through systems in a way that is only evoking laughter. And then the critical aspects of it that, that, that really needs um, conversation are really um, um, downplayed. And whichever attempt it takes to make those critical uh, matters to begin to um, be lifted off and then be discussed is often um, really thrown up uh, away. And so the conversation here, as we find in Baba, she argues that and, and that people's distillation and resentment is expressed in a more subterranean manner, in a form of joke, catchphrases, anecdotes that circulate with great rapidity and undergo many phases of elaboration while they are in vogue 
So there are songs, there are jokes, there are anecdotes that, that people are using as modalities of communicating. But in these same modalities, it is really difficult to um, set apart what is merely a play or what is really a serious matter that deserves attention. And so that 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 brings us to the end of our presentation, and um, it is still a big question that we are here to ask. When we see these performances, these embodied knowledge systems being expressed, um, do we look at do, does does it prompt us to ask serious questions, or we just laugh at it? And in those laughter, are we finding um, uh, cathartic reactions from them? So that brings us to the end of discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, last but not least, Tim Libretti. Okay, you wherever you want to go. You're most comfortable. All right. So hello, everyone. Thank you for sticking around. <laughs> um, it's timely to uh, be at this conference, to giving this talk on International Women's Day. And also uh, timely uh, in an unfortunate way to give this talk in the post row era where we have witnessed um, the violence or the assaults on women's health and life and well-being, um, while not new, being intensified for sure in the United States. Um, and so as I lead into this discussion um, about a feminist approach to genocide that Alice Walker articulates in her novel by the light of my father's smile. I'd just like to begin by reminding us of what Raphael Lemkin said in his foundational writings in inventing and defining the term genocide, because he had a rather robust and sort of broad definition. And he writes, generally speaking, genocide does not mean the immediate destruction of a nation, except when accomplished by mass killings of all members of a nation. It is intended rather to signify a coordinated plan of different actions aiming at the destruction of essential foundations of the life of national groups themselves. The objectives of such a plan would be the disintegration of the political and social institutions, of culture, of language, national feelings, religion, and the economic existence of national groups, and the destruction of the personal security, liberty, health, dignity, and even the lives of of uh, of individuals belonging to such groups. Uh, so certainly while a groundbreaking start, Lemkin's coining of an attempt to define the term genocide has spawned lots of questions uh, that leave the practical meaning, application, and indeed actionable understanding of the term uh, as contested and controversial as ever. John Roth, for example, observes, since Lemkin's coining of the term genocide during World War II as the annihilation of European jewelry raged, Numerous attempts to define genocide have been made. Nevertheless, for various reasons, political and philosophical, the question, what is genocide, remains vexed and unsettled. The results include a paradox. There is a widespread agreement of both that of both the genocide has taken place and that its threats plague the present and the future, and yet the definition of genocide is still contested. Genocide scholars share insights about genocide's nature, but that do not agree on every detail. Governments whose interests are not likely to coincide with those of scholars, at least not completely, may accept formulaic definitions, but when it comes to applying those definitions to concrete cases, the interpretations are likely to diverge as national interests dictate. Alice Walker's novel, By the Light of My Father's Smile, I believe intervenes in these debates and takes on the vexed and unsettled questions, risking what some scholars have worry will be the trivialization of genocide by defining it too broadly. Walker's novel, for its brevity, is quite expansive and encompassing, raising and exploring a range of issues that include violence against women, the re repression of women's sexuality and human sexuality generally, working class oppression, the development of the prison, prison system as the new plantation, the colonization of other cultures, the extermination of the gypsies, and American slavery, to, eno to enumerate only some of the novel's themes. All of these thematics, however, I will argue, Walker links under the rubric of a larger thematic, that of genocide. As she presents in the novel, an analysis of genocide is a broad cultural logic that includes a range of practices our culture tends to accept as normal aspects of routine everyday life. Walker seems to want to get at the root of the genocide cultural logic by exploring the continuum of practices that make possible 
what we perhaps more traditionally identify as genocide. The novel pushes us to recognize that what are perhaps the most obvious acts of genocide are not aberrations from acceptable cultural practices, but rather extensions of the everyday accepted practices in our culture that discount and assault our humanity in any number of ways, threatening the very survival of the human itself. Most broadly, Walker links genocide to patriarchal practices, to what her character Irene calls the general pressing down of life that passes for the male notion of civilization. Indeed, Walker character, Walker's character Irene in particular identifies patriarchal Christianity as a major root of genocidal behavior, arguing that Christian civilization was the consequence of the destruction of matriarchal culture and that it has envied matriarchal culture. Patriarchy's envy, however, expresses itself not in a respectful desire to emulate or learn from women's culture, but rather in a thirst to destroy. The other thing that Europe has lost, Irene tells her friend Susanna, was her mother, her strong mother. When Susanna begs explanation, Irene references the extensive destruction of women the Christian church undertook in the Middle Ages, burning masses of women at the state as witches. Susanna comments, imagine all of them captured, tortured, and systematically put to death over a period of centuries. And then these Christian sons of the Inquisition discovered us as heathen, strolling about in a warm climate, our mother still respected as midwives and healers, our parents still wise in the ways of the plants and the earth. Irene then interjects, better to chop off the heads and cut Indian babies in half or destroy black families in Africa by brutalizing and enslaving them all, all of which they did, than to realize that much of the quote unquote uncivilized world, unlike Europe, had not been forced to kill off its mother and shrink its spirit to half its size. We see clearly in these conversations the view forwarded that at the heart of European genocidal behavior, motivating its drive, is an inhumane patriarchal value system with its attendant practices. Thus, stopping genocide for Walker requires above all reasserting the radical feminist project of eliminating patriarchy around the globe. One important gesture Walker makes in this novel in terms of intervening in the debate over defining genocide, and more importantly, in contributing to our understanding and analysis of the causes and sources of genocidal behavior, is in fact her insistence on defining women as a group who have been historically unrecognized as victims of genocide. By which I mean that women have not typically not been defined as one of the groups or even a group to whom definitions of genocide could apply. Indeed, it is precisely this problem of deciding who constitutes a meaningful group against whom genocide could be perpetrated that abides within discussions of genocide. As Roth notes, genocide involves killing, one-sided killing, it is important to add, but not killing necessarily or always. More extreme than the violation of individual human rights, although it always includes such violations, genocide, which often but not always takes place in wartime, connotes the disruption of a group the destruction of a group. Still, we might ask, what is meant by a group? And we might add, how is destruction to be understood? These questions, and by no means, no means do they exhaust genocide's puzzle, are crucial because what I'm calling the politics of definition makes issues about prevention, intervention, and prosecution of genocide's perpetrators pivot around them. In contributing to this discussion, Walker returns again and again to the historically recursive and contemporarily persistent violence against women that goes unrecognized or is not recognized as culturally systematic in its perpetration, precisely because women are not recognized as a group in the same way that national, religious, or ethnic groups are. Once again, Walker highlights that this failure to see or comprehend violence against women as anything but normal, or the failure to see it at all, is a direct consequence of patriarchal, cultural, and ideological dominance that at once subordinates and targets women for oppression as a group, and at the same time denies them the validity of a group identity, thus obscuring the systematic nature of the destruction. When Susanna visits Greece with her husband Petros and meets, meets Irene, whose past is a legacy of violence against women, as her mother was raped and she was beaten and given to the church as a servant to pay for her mother's sins, Irene tells Susanna of the history of stoning women in Greece. They used to stone women here not so very long ago. Did your husband tell you that? That is what the men tell each other, you know, and whisper into the ears of foreign men when they get a chance to talk together. Ah, uh, women think they want to know what men talk about. You can be sure they stoned a great many before they got their vaunted 
quote unquote democracy in these parts. From my window, I can see one of the stoning pillars. They say that even a hundred years ago, the base of it was still pink from blood. Susana responds to Irene's story, letting her know that this killing of women persists into the present in a systematic fashion. So systematic, the cultures even provide instructions for stoning. As Susanna explains, it goes on today more than most Westerners would ever guess. And in some cultures, they have written in their religious books the size and shape of the stones to be used. Some are of a special size and shape to break the woman's nose, others to crack her skull. There have been many recent stonings in Saudi Arabia and Iran. A few brave men and women had risked their lives to tell the world about them. We see here the characters assert the systematic nature of the destruction of women as a group and as a culture, highlighting how this destruction is held invisible in the operations of supposedly quote unquote democratic society. But this denial is highlighted when Susanna takes Petros to the stoning post and tells him how the women used to be stoned there. He responds, I'm sure they did not. Whatever makes you say such a thing. To be stressed here is also that Walker is not just underscoring the outright and immediate killing of women as a genocidal act, but also at root, the destruction of a culture and way of life. Here we see Walker addressing another major controversy in debates around genocide and the scope of its definition. Again, as Roth explains the difficulty, he writes, one problem with Lemkin's early definition, and it has never gone away, is that genocide covers a multitude of sins. <laughs> the destruction of a nation or of an ethnic group can happen, for example, through deprivation of the means to live and procreate or through killing targeted people outright. In short, the methods of genocide can be diverse. Even killing can be slow and indirect, starvation, for instance, as well as quick and immediate. The destruction process, moreover, can be as subtle as it is prolonged. Procedures to curtail birth rates and to increase mortality can have genocidal effect over time. Eventually, people can disappear if their culture is decimated by eliminating intellectual leadership, dismantling institutions, and suppressing literacy. Among the multitude of sins Walker identifies is precisely the destruction of a woman's culture that accompanies and is signified by what Irene calls the death of Europe's mother. This matriarchal culture for Walker is characterized most prominently by a respect for the body, um, which a sexually repressive patriarchal culture denies, and an honoring and promotion of creativity that in part for Walker emanates from women's fertility and their reproductive abilities. The Mundo culture Walker represents in the novel typifies the life-affirming values that Walker sees patriarchal culture as at root denying and designed to destroy. In explaining cultural practices that motivated the Christian church to destroy the Mundo people and their way of life, for example, the character Manuelito recounts, we explained to them that the ceremony of joining lovers together, we that at the ceremony of joining lovers together, we burn sweet grass to cleanse ourselves and our surroundings, that we use feathers to spread the smoke all around, that eggs were eaten in the hope that the union would be fertile, not just in children, but in ideas, creativity, bountifulness for the tribe. All these things they said they understood. However, they said they did not appreciate the idea of a mother and father touching the breasts and kissing the vulva and phallus of their grown children, even to bless them. We explained that the kissing was respectful, the lightest touch, but they did not care. Because we practiced this, they raided our village, hacked off our heads with machetes, enslaved us to work in the gold and silver mines, burned our children alive. Obviously here, Walker's counterpointing two cultures, two ways of life, and highlighting the irony of the church's assertion of moral superiority when at the same time it engages in murder, exploitation, and brutality against the culture and people for ritualistically honoring human creativity and sexuality. What we can see here though, is precisely how cultural destruction constitutes a genocidal act by destroying the way of life, the institutions that underpin the people's existence and even more broadly supported and promoted life as opposed to the patriarchal culture Walker represents which acts out of a sense of its own repression in dishonoring the body, sexuality and creativity generally. We see how this cultural destruction as Ross suggests can be seen can be the cause of a slow and indirect genocide in the novel through the characters of Magdalena and Manuelito. Magdalena uh, is the eldest daughter of the father of the novel's title, By the Light of My Father's Smile. The parents in the novel earn a grant from the church to study the Mundo culture in, Me in Mexico. Although they earn this grant claiming to be missionaries because as black scholars, they have difficulty procuring funding from other institutional sources. In it, the father, whom we know, uh, who becomes concerned over his daughter's budding sexuality, or what he thought was her budding sexual interest, 
um, which we learned later was an interest in zippers, which kept her fixated on men's crotches. When Magdalena does become sexually active with the Mundo boy Manuelito, the father brutalizes his daughter with a belt and buckle, which leads to her developing an eating disorder that manifests a general alienation from and disrespect for her body, and that ends up killing her in the novel as she literally eats herself to death. The point here, I think, is that this behavior develops out of the destruction of the values of the Mundo culture and the imposition of values that dishonor sexuality, particularly women's sexuality, leading finally to the slow death of Magdalena, demonstrating the prolonged and indirect effects of patriarchal genocidal behavior. Similarly, seeing his people and way of life being destroyed, Manuelito ends up coming to the US, joining the US military and having his body effectively mangled in war. Again, Walker not only points up the contrast between a culture that promotes life and a culture that promotes death through its disrespect and exploitation of the body, but she highlights the drawn out processes of genocide, which can make it difficult to identify. Moreover, again, her representational analysis traces the roots of genocidal behavior to a sexually repressive patriarchal culture that is ashamed of the human body and thus by extension for Walker, life itself. It is this root value that in Walker's analysis motivates the behavior we might most obviously identify as genocide, but also a range of behaviors in, every, in our everyday life that enable, and perhaps Walker suggests, constitute genocidal behavior in the way that they deny human creativity although they are not traditionally defined as genocide. The novel's analytical method in this regard is to highlight more obviously genocidal behavior, to draw connections between these, those experiences and behaviors, and then to identify connections to cultural practices that would not necessarily be defined as genocide. Susanna at one point wonders, for example, after reading a letter in which Irene compares African-Americans and gypsies, what made the difference between them, between black Americans and black gypsies? or between gypsies and the Noonga aboriginals or of Australia, or between the gypsies and the completely exterminated indigenous population of Tasmania. Walker then, however, extends her analysis of genocide to practices that deny humanity in exploitive ways, as when, for example, Susanna says of the prison system, it's a plantation. The prisons are a contemporary plantation and what is produced is produced by slave labor. Walker's tact mirrors that of scholar Nancy Shepard Hughes, who suggests we see genocide as a continuum made up of a multitude of small wars and invisible genocides conducted in the normative space, social spaces of public schools, clinics, emergency rooms, hospital wards, nursing homes, courtrooms, prisons, detention centers, and public morgues. The continuum, she writes, refers to the human capacity to reduce others to non-persons, to monsters, or to things that give structure, meaning, and rationale to everyday practices of violence. Shepard Hughes includes, quote, all expressions of social exclusion, exclusion, dehumanization, dehumanization, depersonalization, pseudo-speciation, and reification that normalize atrocious behavior and violence toward others. While she admits she is on thin ice in genocide debates in developing this continuum, mm -hmm. taking what she calls the moral risk in overextending the concept of genocide into spaces and corners of everyday life where we might not ordinarily expect to find it, she argues there is an even greater risk in misrecognizing proto-genocidal behaviors we have normalized. Walker, I believe in this novel, takes a similar risk in extending traditional feminist analyses of patriarchy to the realm of genocide, in fact, identifying patriarchal practice and values as the rational root of genocidal practice and its design for women, the body, se sexuality, in short, for the very materiality in which we live out our lives and in the very practices that make us most essentially human and creative. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, um, I want to I want to bring out a few a few themes that I find very interesting, um, and again that I see as cross cutting themes across these presentations, uh, and then let's open up the floor uh, for some discussion. How much time do we have? Uh, Okay, good. We have um, we have a little more than ten minutes. Um, so I I see I I think of what Victor had said uh, uh, about in his presentation uh, right before our panel about the power of art to not only document genocide but also to transform narratives uh, and not only of trauma but also of survival and resilience. Right, and so we're looking in these three papers at the ways in which 
uh, narrative um, through a novel, but also through performance, how we're narrating ourselves actively through the process of reading and through the process of sharing our cultural expressions with others, right? How we transform our understanding of ourselves in the world and how we might be able to use art, uh, these forms of expression uh, to, um, to challenge proto-genocidal tendencies. Uh, and this has also been a theme uh, across the board. We don't call it genocide until it's already happened, right? How do we intervene uh, when it's not identified as a genocidal problem? And to identify it as a genocidal problem would undermine the legal specificity of the tool, right? So we've got a paradox here with respect to how we use legal tools to address societal problems. Uh, and um, so uh, Chinaza Igere has brought out the narration of traditional African values uh, in Nigeria, in Nigerian literature, two works of Nigerian literature in particular. Um, and she's talked about how they can, a the idea of traditional narrative uh, African values can either be used to undermine or to celebrate women's agency. And actually it's pretty indeterminate as to what traditional African values really are. Uh, what, what a pre-colonial African uh, experience of gender uh, an experience of being in the world could really be because we are filtering our understanding of traditional values through our knowledge of the present. So the past is in contrast to a colonial and post-colonial present in which there is um, there are lots of issues of shame and of mimicry, right? Of, of repetition, of imitation that come out of the colonial experience. So, um, I want to ask uh, Chinasa um, how these um, these differing narratives play out in Nigeria with respect to how um, how men and women are thinking about traditional African values. I mean, in the U.S., reading novels has become an increasingly elite activity, and people aren't really reading novels very much. And so, I'd like to know. Um, if um, people are reading Adichie in Nigeria, we're certainly reading her here, uh, but, um, and do narratives such as the headstrong historian reflect or impact changing attitudes of women's agency in Nigeria? Yeah. Well, thank you so Start much for the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my question. Yeah. <laughs> yes, for the, you know, the use of literature in Nigeria, I can tell you that most Nigerians um, are really reading literature that are deeply involved in it. And uh, with a personality like Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, who is so popular and who, you know, has been involved in different TED Talks where, you know, she keeps um, talking about feminism, you know, and the fact that she is, um, you know, just trying to you know, kind of raise that awareness, make people conscious of, you know, how feminism, how everybody should, you know, own up to it and be in support of it uh, by, you know, something that can actually help African women exert agency and the undermine oppression. Yeah, I can really attest to the fact that many, many people, especially those in secondary school, you know, where um, they are kind of being mandated to read some of these literary works. Uh, a work by uh, Chinua Achebe, for instance, you know, and some other prolific uh, literary writers are being read widely in uh, institutions, both in secondary and tertiary level. So that kind of reception is there and um, people, you know, are getting more aware of you know the role literature plays, so it is not downplayed. It's something that is deeply prioritized in Nigeria, and I'm very certain in you know in Africa, right? So um, literature is not just taken for granted, and people also women you know are coming out to you know talk about African feminism because they want to bring out the context, you know that 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 uniqueness, that multiplicity in feminisms, right? We want to 
we want to reposition ourselves. We don't want inequality. We are fighting against that, right? But then we are looking at it from the African perspective, you know, based on our social, cultural, um, social, cultural, political, and economic uh, positionality. So for literature, Africans, Nigerians are reading literary works. And um, we have this kind of affinity for the works of Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Uh -huh. Okay, wonderful. And in fact, that's a, that's a great segue to my next question. Um, of course, you know, those of us who you know grew up reading novels, and when we identify with characters uh, in novels, we we see versions of ourselves, ways in which we could be, and and I um, I see how um, um, Abigail and uh, Viashima's uh, presentation also um, talks about these uh, fora for queer. Um, cultural experimentation as places in which people can sort of envision and imagine other ways of being uh, and through laughter, right? Uh, through, through satire uh, and uh, how these uh, fora of, of cultural experimentation can be very quite effervescent uh, under conditions of, uh, of patriarchal repression. And so, you know, there are these very different experiences of cross-dressing and virtual and personal spaces that you describe in your paper. It suggests that neither homophobic legislation on one hand, reg regulating heteronormativity, nor the free space of social media on the other, offer a complete picture of what's going on, of, of the experience of queer culture in Nigeria and Ghana. So this leads me to wonder how these distinct modalities of queer performance might influence one another. Um, and, and have there been efforts to shut down social media forums in which queer experimentation takes place? How might this effervescent cultural experimentation that you describe, a form of mimicry in Baba's sense, um, how could that be mobilized to support more conventional forms of advocacy and intervention? Let me pick some uh, and respond. So uh, first I'll start by saying that, yes, there are efforts to stifle social relations in Nigeria. Um, so in Nigeria, we have this, this platform um, called Kito. Kito is a platform where uh, queer identified persons meet, connect, socialize, that's like a free space for them to articulate their experiences and their subjectivities. Right. The government got hold of that platform, infiltrated it, and used it to um, complicate their experiences. For example, um, a government agent, we joined Keto, sent out requests claiming to be um, for example, an LGBTQ plus person um, arrange meetings, and then when you meet, you get arrested. Or sometimes you find the government mobilizing hoodlums um, or paying thugs, not rightly, who will uh, engage in such connections with the intention of getting people who are members of uh, the LGBTQ plus community. And when these people, um, uh, when they are able to get hold of these individuals, then sometimes they, they, they kidnap them, they, they harass them, uh, uh, they, they, they try to expose them to a wide range of experiences. Some of these people are arrested and handed over to uh, police and other uh, law uh, authorities. So yes, there is that effort in Nigeria to, uh, 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 let me say, complicate the experiences or complicate systems and structures that are developed by people to engage in the so-called anti-normative um, ways of being. Um, Abigail, you want to go? Then? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just just briefly, it's it's interesting how it is manifesting, particularly in Ghana. So, um, once there is that overt need to resist 
um, through protest. I mean, it, it is met with um, counter protest from heteronormative forces that exist. But once it's um, just confined to that space of playing, a, it is still um, also met with that level of um, recognizing the playfulness in it. But um, subsequently, people are beginning to read deeper meanings into these um, performances at, as they are manifesting. So the, there's, there's, there's one post that I saw, there are kids who um, just, yeah, their parents uh, um, put them on social media. And then those one that, they, they are twins, and then one was cross-dressed. And then in the comment section, that's where all the action happens. And then in the comment section, people were pointing out that this is how um, uh, um, same sex and all these um, inspirations are Beth. So they should avoid um, cross-dressing their kids. So people are now um, reading deeper meanings into it. But once it, it, is, it becomes an overt moment of expression resistance it is met with counter resistance from from um wh wh whether in the private or in the public space and once it is still in the realm of playing or mimicking and uh, which is often met with a certain level of ambivalence then it is quite complicated to really um, analyze the nuances that's very interesting. So actually, this is um, a way in which art can be a very effective form of consciousness raising, because if it becomes too explicitly political, then it's going to draw uh, a violent response. Yeah. So that, that's a really interesting uh, dimension. Um, okay. Dr. Libretti's paper brings to mind Dr. Bethia's remark from earlier uh, during our previous panel that the U.S., uh, is at the forefront of recognizing genocides that are not its own, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, right here we have, um, you know, a perfect example of how the politics of definition erases the problem of cultural genocide, uh, uh, for example, uh, or slow and indirect forms of violence um, that, you know, are very physical in their manifestations. Um, and so Walker identifies as genocide um, the failure to see or comprehend violence against women as anything but normal. Okay, so the question that his very nuanced reading brings up for me is how we might think about genocide in a dual register. I struggle with this myself. I mean, a lot. Uh, acknowledging the limits to legal strategy, right? In which, for instance, proving intent becomes um, essential, despite the fact that it's a real epistemological quagmire. Proving intent is always a profoundly political determination, and it's not going to work under um, circumstances in which um, that intent uh, is, um, uh, well, in which it's not going to be politically feasible uh, to do that. So um, how do we acknowledge uh, the limitations of the defin of Lemkin's definition uh, in a legal and in an advocacy context, while also conceptualizing extreme forms of hegemonic violence in broader terms. Um, you know, how can we think on both um, on both levels at once, uh, rather than um, taking a one side or the other approach? Uh, and I don't know the answer to that. I was going to say, I wish I knew. Um, <laughs> But I only sort of tell you my own approach. So I, I, you know, Alice Walker writes a novel. A novel could be a best-selling novel, sell millions of copies, be read. It's still gonna be slow going in terms of an overall cultural transformation, right? In terms of altering our consciousness and and eroding any any you know social legal <laughs> structures that exist in our society, cultural habits. Um, but I, I do think so. There's there's there is the cultural front, and you know Walker, with the exception of when she talks about the Roma, doesn't even use the term genocide in the novel, right? I think that was a critical gesture where I said that I believe this is the story she's telling, mm -hmm. and in my own cultural work, I've seen this term as incredibly valuable, um, 
as opposed to just talking about racial oppression, sexual oppression, these kinds of things, because it's such a powerful word. It highlights the fact of what's actually being done, which is the undermining of people's lives in a kind of murder, slow or fast, um, the, the destruction of a group. Um, and in legal terms, it's actionable, right? It has something meaning. It's difficult to get to that level though, right? I mean, we can, I'm sure it's been talked about. I haven't been fully present at this conference, but we look at the Ukraine, it's frustrating. We have to go and gather evidence. We have to go to this court. It's like on one level, it's so apparent, right? What is happening in terms of the destruction of a people. Um, and yet the legal, as you say, it's always gonna be after the fact, but we can work on the cultural front to create a recognition um, for me, particularly in the US to even uh, kind of recognize what is happening to get people to think of violence against women, against, uh, you know, the uh, uh, revocation of Roe and these kinds of things as participating in this broader cultural logic. Um, and what, you know, Walker's novel sort of intervenes in thinking about intent and these kinds of things and asks us, I think, we live in systems that condition us, but people carry these things out. That's a difficult legal haul. Mm -hmm. um, but even just beginning to circulate this term and name things within our culture, while a slow process, I do think is a very necessary one that I would love to see us get to a moment where we can say there are nine people in the United States making enormous decisions about our lives. And let's take these people to international court, <laughs> right? Um, again, obviously those are, you know, big lifts, long hauls. Um, but working on the cultural front is, I mean, I don't think any of us expect immediate results in cultural transformation in the work that we do, but it's, it's a, it's a front. Yes. Right. And all of these papers are about cultural transformation and how that takes place. Um, I realize we're out of time. I would like to open up for just a, a question or two, uh, before we move on, Chris. Yeah. Um. International law, there's not an enforcement mechanism for the most part, but it doesn't mean bringing a case to the International Court of Justice or the ICC uh, is not it, it's not irrelevant because it then becomes a location for which the cultural <laughs> So I don't know about I have you you're making me think about it from the flip side, and I appreciate that because I usually it's difficult to find because I come from this side to think about the flip right. side. I think you're. I think you're right, and I think that's that's part of my investment in bringing this term into cultural work. And instead of just talking about race, class, gender, and how these processes destroy people, to to name it, because it does have this legal legal force. Yeah. Any and uh, anyone from the online uh, the online community? No. Any other questions? Yes. Ah, Krista. Oh. Well, Alice Walker's book, to my knowledge, was not banned. I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know all the books that have been banned in all the crazy states um, going on in our country. Um, and I'll take your question seriously. How do I feel about books being banned? You could probably guess. You know, it sucks. It's uh, it's horrific. It's it's fascist. I don't know what else to say. Is counter to everything we believe in. I hope it's an interesting question, though, Crystal. Also, because it brings it, it, it piggybacks on what Chris was just saying about um, the legal front for cultural war, right? Um, and how um, we can say that the legal forum for fighting genocide and the cultural forum are quite distinct, and yet they interpenetrate in all kinds of ways. And this push to ban books is an example of that. Yeah, I said too. It's just the odd that, that you know, that funding group also created an odd that shoes part of the copy of food, right? There is a necessity of food for reading bad books. Right. And people are 
Some sort of response, and that is actually very, very interesting. It's a dialectic movement, right? And I think that that also illustrates the point of our second paper on queer performance, right? That that it's also true that under a context of legal repression, uh, this um, this ambiguous expression. Uh, uh, becomes almost more it, it, it's a creative it creates a creative space in response um in that liminal that liminal space yes I, have to um, uh -huh. I grew up in a country where books were bad right i grew up in romania and i was covered in uh, until 89 and there were a, a lot of bad books hopefully every single book that our father has run on the first page and our mother at the second page. Um, and once they uh, were no longer our father and mother, started drawing mustaches on them um, as a rebellion. But like books were banned, so everything had to be hush hush when you wanted a book or you wanted to read a certain writer, you would make sure that you hid very well from that. That is point number one, but then there, on Netflix, there's the show in the dark about the blind girl that reads on um, in uh, Hebrew, uh, not in Hebrew, like uh, Braille, Braille, but yeah. she reads over radio frequency that the Nazis try to pinpoint where she's reading from in order to promote it. In, she's decoding messages of freedom for the resistance. Um, so there's like a lot of awareness, I think, this day about genocide. It's just a, a matter of like openness of people of receiving the message, you know, and it's just being in tune with the reality because it's still happening. It, it happened 50 years ago, but it still happens now. Mm -hmm. And I think the only thing that promotes genocide and any kind of evil in this world is silence and the fact that you know, that's right that's right okay um uh and with that uh art definitely being a response uh a way of filling silence and countering silence and bringing bringing these ideas into our everyday lives um i turn I turn things over to our next panel. I don't know that we have time for a break, unfortunately. Uh, uh, apologize for that. Thank you. And thank you to our presenters online. Wonderful papers. This is, this is really phenomenal. And this is, I think, uh, bearing a witness for that we should never ban books uh, because this books, yeah, this books definitely strike critical conversations uh, that are, that definitely can make a difference um, in people's life and they are, are transformational. <laughs>